going bit by bit, I will show images of Blake's Spout cyst. And I hope that after the next five minutes of explanation, you will understand why I have chosen this image of a dive breach in Arkansas in 2019 as an introduction picture. An easy way to memorize Blake's Spout cyst is to consider it an imperforation of the foramen of Majemli. This leads to a cyst that has a wide communication with the fourth ventricle, mass effect on the cerebellar vermis and cerebellar hemispheres, but no hypoplasia, as is the case in Danny Walker malformation, and also a normal position of the torcular in Blake's spout cyst. Sometimes a thin septum is visible, separating Blake's spout cyst from the subarachnoid space. In vlog 23, I have explained the embryology of the posterior fossa in detail. And in Blake's spout cyst, there is a problem with the posterior membranous area. The Roof of the fourth ventricle gets divided by the primitive choroid plexus into an anterior and posterior membranous area. And you can also see it in this picture where the primitive manix that is derived from the mesoderm is colored red and the neural tube is colored brown. And the primitive choroid plexus starts to produce some CSF before there's a communication between the ventricular system and the subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space develops from cavitation of the primitive manix, and at a certain point in time, the posterior membranous area starts to bulge or pouch, and that's called Blake's pouch after Joseph Blake. And in the ninth or 10th gestational week, there's perforation of the roof of Blake's pouch establishing communication between the ventricular system and the subarachnoid space. These are images from Joseph Blake's article from 1900 and he did a very extensive study on the roof and the apertures of the fourth ventricle. And these are drawings of human embryos in the sagittal plane 130 days. So there's a little bit of the pons cut off here. This is the medulla, this is the cerebellum, I've rotated the images from the original article. You can see the fourth ventricle here. This was the part of the ventricle that was ballooning into the subarachnoid space. And um, this is at 130 days, so Blake's pouch has already perforated, but you can still see the ghost. And also at a transverse drawing. At the level of the medulla, you can see that the median part of the cisterna magna has a ventricular origin and not a subarachnoid origin. So the um, border between the ventricular system and the subarachnoid space is not at the level of what we see as Magenli's foramen, but a little bit more posterior. Another cyst that can occur in the posterior fossa is an arachnoid cyst, when something goes wrong with the cavitation of the primitive manix. And you can tell the difference between an arachnoid cyst, as you can see in this sagittal T1 and transverse T2 image, is that the arachnoid cyst is located posterior of the cerebellum and there's no widening of the uh, foramen of Magendi. Whereas in Blake's pouch cyst, you can see the wide communication between the cyst and the fourth ventricle. And you can also look at the choroid plexus, because in Blake's pouch cyst, the choroid plexus continues into the cystic malformation. And to conclude, I want to show a very nice case report from 2013 where a Blake spout cyst was diagnosed at 25 gestational weeks with a cyst in the posterior fossa and an increased tegmentovermian angle but no hypoplasia of the vermis 
and on the postnatal MRI, the Blake spout cyst had resolved or there had been delayed perforation of the roof or of the top of Blake spout cyst. And one of the postulated mechanisms of a megacisterna magna is a delayed perforation of Blake spout cyst. Thanks for watching and until next time when we will continue in the posterior fossa with the Chiari malformations.